My name is Heather Fay, and I am the Botetourt Advisor and the Regional Program Director for the Roanoke Regional Small Business Development Center. And today you are joining us for our Work Opportunity Tax Credit Information Session. So hopefully everybody is in the right spot this morning. And as we get started, we're gonna go over a few housekeeping things. This meeting is being recorded. If you will please keep your microphone muted and add any questions you have for Tom and I to the chat, and we will address those during the Q&A session. If you would like closed captioning at the bottom of your screen, if you are joining us from your computer, you should see a menu that almost is hidden. And if you hover down at the bottom of your screen, you will see that, and that gives you the opportunity to see where the chat is for you to add your question and answers, to see what other participants are in this room is also Look for the closed captioning if you would like that option. All right, a little bit about the SBDC. For those of you that are not familiar, we are funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the US Small Business Administration, supported by America's SBDC, Virginia's SBDC, and the Mason Enterprise Center. Go Virginia, local organizations, government offices, and businesses who provide matching funds. Our host who serves as our fiscal agent is the Roanoke Regional Chamber of Commerce. The Roanoke Regional SBDC currently serves the greater Roanoke Valley, Allegheny Highlands, and the New River Valley. For those of you that are joining us from across the state or even out of state, there are SBDCs near you. The Virginia SBDC network is composed of 27 different small business development centers, and I will post a link in the chat if you would like to connect with your local SBDC. All right, we have a couple upcoming events. We have a SWAM information session on November 17th, as well as a Canva workshop on December 2nd. More information about that can be found on our website. And also coming up, we are finishing up Cybersecurity Month. This Friday, we have a Firewall Friday. Next week is National Veterans Small Business Week. And of course, everybody loves Shop Small Saturday. So that is on November 27th. Hard to believe that we are coming close to wrapping up this year. All right, through the SBDC, we help you with your business so you can get on with your big ideas. Um, we can be connected with through social media, by call or text, by email, and through our website where you can find lots of great information. Um, this recording will be sent out to you after the close of the presentation, along with the copy of the slides, and it'll also be posted on our YouTube channel. All right, without further ado, let me introduce you to our host today, who is Mr. Tom Tanner. Tom is our lead advisor, as well as our vet biz coordinator. So Tom, take it away. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, let's go ahead, and if you haven't answered the poll, take a few seconds to answer the poll so I can kind of see. We've got mostly, most people don't have not heard of the work opportunity tax credit and it looks like everybody is looking for employees boy that's the first time i've heard that so i think we'll go ahead and close this poll out in five four three two one and i'll share the results real quick whoops share the results real quick so everybody can see what we're looking for and a few people looking for warm but can't even find warm bodies you know and i've been in that position before all right so stop sharing and then we're going to roll. So this morning, I guess I need to share my screen first, don't I, Heather? So let me see here. Give me a second and get organized here. Um, all right. Is that looking right, Miss uh, Heather? We see the presenter view. Yes, you're seeing the one that says work opportunity tax credit. Yes, yeah, so if you want to change it to, I'm seeing your the presenter view version of it. Oh, in other words, I hit the wrong screen. Correct. All right, let's try this again here. How about that one? Perfect. All right. So now let's get started here. So 
What we're going to talk about today is the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. And really, I'm just trying to give you some basic information. It is a, a good credit. You'll see as we go through this process, it's going to look like, like man, this is a lot of work. Um, but in the end, it's not really as difficult as it seems once you've set up systems to do it. So after this, at least you can determine whether or not it makes sense for your business. It may make sense for your business now. It may not now, but later on, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, before I start, I always got to do my dis disclaimer, which basically means is uh, I based it on documents as of the day. I made the best, inf uh, best efforts to interpret the information. And who knows if the IRS, DL, Congress, Virginia may modify or change the procedure. So before applying for it, you certainly always want to check with your attorney or accountant just to make sure that there's no changes in the program. All right. So what is the Work Opportunity Tax Credit or WOTC? So this was created back in 1996. It's basically a, an incentive for employees employers to find job applicants that normally have a hard time finding employee employment and they target 10 different target groups and these 10 target groups change from time to time but we're going to go over the ones that are current and right now this program is funded through december 31st 2025 most likely it will continue, as you said, it's been around since 1996, so it's probably going to be around after that, too. All right, so let's jump right into the 10 targeted groups that are covered. So the first group is individuals who are in the uh, 4A recipient or basically are receiving assistance under the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or some of you have heard of it under TAF or TANF. All right, so the qualifying is the assistance must be received for any nine month period during the eighth, 18th month prior to the hiring date. So whenever you're getting ready, if you're going to hire somebody, if they or their family member, and family member means who's in the same household, has been receiving uh, TA and F for any nine month period in the previous 18th month, then that would count as person within this category. All right, that's the first category. Second category is a little bit more complicated <clears throat> and it actually involves multiple categories. So qualified veteran. So qualified veteran can fall under four different categories. One is it's a family member receiving assistance under SNAP, which is the food stamps. And their qualification is at least three months period ending on the 12 month period before the hiring date. In other words, during the 12 month period prior to you hiring someone, did their family or did the individual receive food stamp for at least three months period ending during that time period? Again, you're gonna have all this presentation at the end uh, and all the slides and plenty of documentation I'm gonna send out with all the forms. So it, you don't need to memorize this stuff or take notes because it is kind of complicated. All right, so the second part of the vet qualified veteran is an unemployed veteran who's been employed at least, uh, unemployed for at least four weeks, um, but less than six months. And why we say less than six months, because it's a different category. And it doesn't have to be consecutive. It just has to be at least four weeks during the previous one year period, okay? The third is unemployed for a period total in at least six months. In other words, more than six months during the previous 12 months if they've been unemployed for at least six months or more during the previous one year, then that's another qualification. Again, these are all independent qualifications. So the next one is a disabled veteran. This is a disabled veteran from a service-connected disability, not just somebody who's a veteran who's been disabled, but a service-connected disability. Someone who was hired less than a year after being discharged from active duty. OK, so if you find somebody who's been recently recharged within the last year, they're, they're, they have a service-connected disability and you hire them, then they fall under a particular category. And then the last category is you have a disabled veteran, again, service-connected, who's been unemployed for a period of at least six months 
in the one year period ending on the hiring day. And again, these periods do not have to be consecutive. In other words, they don't have to be six months consecutive. It just means that they worked for a month, they didn't work for a month. They worked for a month, they didn't work for a month, but it was six months during the past 12 months. All right, well, the next one's a little easier. <clears throat> the next one's basically an ex-felon. So this is a qualified ex-felon who has been released, been convicted, and released from prison within one year from the time, and one year means from the time that you want to hire the individual. All right, the next category, which is probably not going to affect too many people here, but I'll just go over it, is someone who lives within a designated community resident, which is somebody who resides in an empowerment zone, an enterprise community, a renewal community, uh, and, and continues to live there after employment. And there also have to be between 18 and 40. So your question probably is, how do I know what an empowerment zone, enterprise community, and renewal community is? I conclude this little link to a map that you can click on it goes to, but I will show you the map, which is going to show you there's not many around here. So the probably the ones that you're going to see more than anything are the ones in Clifton Forge and Covington. And then there's some in the um, up near Grundy and north of Taswell and a few of those areas around there and way down um, southwest Virginia. So nothing around this area besides the Covington Clifton Forge. That's why I said probably it's not going to apply to most of the employees around here, employees around here. All right, so the next category is a vocational rehabilitation referral. So this is somebody who's gone through, who re, re, is going through some sort of vocational rehabilitation through one of the agencies because of a physical or a mental disability and then in turn have been referred to an employer. Now they may have been completed, uh, they may have completed a class or you know, a, a system or they're going through that, et cetera, et cetera. Normally this is gonna come through things such as DARS, which is Division of Rehabilitation Services, or it might come through the Department of Blind and Visual Impairment. There's also through the Social Security Administration, this thing called the Ticket to Work Program, uh, which is a place to, way to get people who are on social, uh, SSI or disability, Social Security disability to return to work through a special program. And there might also be a program through Department of Veterans Affairs. All right, the next one is also for, this includes summer youth employment, which probably is also not gonna to apply to most of you because they have to live within the same empowerment zone, enterprise zone, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just gonna skip over that, but that is available for you in case you happen to live near one of those, you want to hire a summer youth, here's the qualifications. So this is a big one, which is probably something you as an employer are going to see more than anything else. Somebody who's on the SNAP recipient, which is, you know, food stamps. So that would be somebody who is at least 18 years old, but less than 40 and a family member um, that receives SNAP benefits. And this is somebody within their family in the same household. It doesn't mean that, hey, I got a great, great granddad that that receives it, that doesn't count. It has to be within the same household. And they had to receive it for at least the previous six months prior to the hiring date, or at least three of the previous five months. So you'll see a lot of these things have very particular requirements that you have to, to meet in order to qualify for those. So this is another one, which is SSI, which is so, a supplemental social security or security income, which comes from the SSA. So this is somebody who's a recipient of SSI, and they have to show that they've been receiving benefits from SSI within the last 60 days, and that would also qualify them under this program, because uh, if they get a, a job under this program, they most likely would lose their SSI benefits, so that's why it has to be somebody who's actively involved in it. All right, so this is a big one too. And this is one where uh, it's an actual, it's the only one that's actually a two year program. So this is a long-term family recipient. So this is any individual who at the time of hiring is a member of family that meets one of the following conditions. So we've kind of covered some of these things, but they're all under the 4A program, which is the TNF or the TAFTA um, program. And they've have to been receiving 
assistance for at least the prior 18 months, consecutive months, or have received assistance for at least 18 months over the last two years. The other uh, cause would be if for some reason they were receiving it and they were cut off because of, of a change in federal or state law that says, hey, you can't take it anymore, but it's still that they would have to have been under the last two years. In other words, they, they didn't have to do, it's not necessarily 18 months, but if within the last two years they lost it because they were, were no longer eligible because of assistance they received, I mean, because of change in policies or procedures or something. Again, that's a two-year program. In a second, we'll go, go over top of the actual credit and how that works. <clears throat> so the one that probably you also may see a lot of, especially during COVID, where we still have a lot of people who have not come back into the workforce, even though there's plenty of jobs, is a qualified long-term unemployment recipient. So this is somebody who has been unemployed for at least 27 consecutive weeks at the time of hire. In other words, they've had to be unemployed as of the time that you're getting ready to hire them. Um, and received unemployment compensation during some or all of their employment period. So if you have somebody who's finally interested in coming back into the workforce and they've been unemployed for, you know, years or, you know, for long times of period, at least 27 weeks, then they also qualify under this particular program. So that's another one I think you probably could possibly see people um, who could be applicants for that. All right, so now the big question is, is how much is the credit? So it depends on partly on the, on the category that they fall under. So first of all, the credit is typically, and I'll go over the exceptions, but typically it's 40% if the employee worked at least 400 hours. That doesn't mean 400 hours in a year. It just means that they worked 400 hours. In other words, it could span over two year period, but did they work at least 400 hours? Then it's a 40% credit. There is wage limitations, which we'll cover. If they worked at least 120 hours, but less than 400, it's 25% um, of, their, of their wage limitations. So let's just jump into the wage limitations. So for most of the targeted groups, again, I'll cover the exceptions in a second, but the ones I don't cover in any exceptions is covered under this um, for most of them. So basically it's limited to the first $6,000 in wages. So once they earn $6,000, they're, they're qualified. You've, you've reached the maximum amount of wages that you can claim for this individual. So let's just take, for example, if they worked at least 400 hours, you would get 40% of the $6,000 or 2,400. If they worked at least 120, but less than 400, you would get $1,500. So that kind of shows you what most of the categories are. So some of the exceptions now. So let's talk about first the service disabled veteran that's hired within one year of being discharged. And again, it has to be a service connected disability. So the way this one works is that the the income limitation is now $12,000 rather than $6,000. So in other words, you can claim up to 12,000, a credit towards the 12,000. So if the employee works at least 400 hours, you'll take 40% um, of that 12,000, which is 4,800. If they work more than 120, but less than 400, then you'll be able to take a credit of $3,000. All right, for the next exception, it's gonna be the service disabled veteran with at least six months of unemployment within the last 12 months. So this is the big one that you can get the most benefits off of. Again, it does not have to be consecutive periods. It just has to be, it have to be at least six months over the last 12. So now you can now claim up to $24,000 in wages. So that means that and it's a little weird because if you fall below the 400 hour limitation, 
you not only lose the percentage drop from 40 to 25, but you also lose the wage drop um, cap from 24,000 to 12,000. <clears> but so this will give you an example. If, if you have somebody in this category and they work more than 400 hours and they've earned more than 20, $24,000 and more, you can actually get a credit of $9,600. Now, if they drop below 400, then you're only gonna be able to claim the $12,000 maximum limitation at 25%, which means it's $3,000. So this is, like I said, this is the biggie that you wanna, if you can, this is the biggie one you wanna go after. So <clears throat> the next one is for unemployed veterans, not necessarily disabled, but any unemployed veterans with at least six months of unemployment. If it's less than six months, they're gonna fall under the, the typical, but if they're more than six months of unemployment within the last 12 months, then their credit is now $14,000 in wages. So that you can claim up to the 14,000. So again, if they work more than 400 hours, you get 40% of the 14, or if they work less than 400, but more than 120, you'll get a $3,500 credit. All right, is everybody cold you can cheer so far? Hopefully not. So, all right. So one more, well, I guess two more, but <clears throat> the biggie, this is for the long-term family assistance recipient. This is the two-year program. So what happens is, is that you're limited to 10,000, your, your, your wage limitation is $10,000, but you'll get 40% of the $10,000 in year one. And then if they're working in year two and earn at least $10,000, then you'll get 50% of their first $10,000 in year two. So in other words, and again, they must be employed for at least 400 hours. So basically for the two year period, if you have an employee that falls within this category, you can get a $9,000 credit for this employee for the two year time period. The key is they have to be working for at least 400 hours to take this credit. If they don't work 400 hours, and that doesn't mean per year, that just means 400 hours for the program, then they qualify for the program. If they don't qualify for the program, in other words, if it's less than 400, then you'll be able to take advantage of just the one-year program through one of the other programs. But then you're only limited to a $2,400 maximum. And then this is the credit for the summer youth program, which we talked about. And this has got some particularities to that. I'll also include in the stuff I'm saying now, this is something that's publicized by the um, Department of Labor, which kind of goes over this whole program. It also talks about the, the documentary evidence that may be required um, by the state in order to get approved. It may not be, but if you do, this is the kind of the documents that you would need. This document is about 10 pages long, so this is only the first page of it, but I'll send the entire document. All right, so now we talk about how do I receive the credit? Because that's the big point. Um, a little bit more complicated than it seems. Um, the credit is limited to the amount of the business income tax liability. So if your business has no income tax liability, then you really can't take advantage of this credit unless you think you're gonna be able to have income tax liability in the, first, in the future. In other words, if you're a C corporation, then you would take it on your uh, C corporation tax return, this particular credit under general, uh, general tax credits. All right. For most of you, you're probably a flow through entity, which means you're a sole proprietor, you're set up as a partnership, you're set up as an S corporation. And that doesn't mean whether you're set up as an LLC or a corporation, it's, it's the tax structure that you're set up. Then what happens is the credits can be taken on the owner's personal income tax return rather than the corporate tax return. OK, so in other words, it's, it's done by the company, but it passes along to the owners on their K-1s or if it's a sole proprietor on their personal income tax return. Now, if you don't have any personal income tax, then you also probably would not be able to take advantage of it right now. But it does fall, fall under the carry forward um, tax credits 
which means that you can carry forward for many, many years for it. So if sometime in the future you have a taxable income, you can take the credit at that time. Again, this is not a refundable credit, which means you don't get a refund regardless if you have uh, tax liability or not. You have to have a tax liability. Now, this program also works for tax exempt employers, but the difference being it only applies to the qualified veterans targeted group. It doesn't apply to anything else. And it also goes against the payroll taxes paid for, uh, for uh, the wages. In other words, it goes against the 941 since tax exempt don't have income tax liability. The other thing you always have to think about, and this applies to any of the other tax credits, is making sure that your calculation is not using credits from other programs, such as the ERC or the employee retention credits, PPP, um, family paid medical leave attic, um, any of those other programs out there, you got to make sure you're not double dipping into the program. All right, as to rehires, you cannot hire a rehire. In other words, it prohibits a, an employee from claiming a credit under, um, under this program for an employee has worked for that employer prior to the employee hiring date. In other words, if, if the person already had employed and then they left and coming back, you cannot take this credit for them. All right, now for the steps that hopefully you don't find too under, uh, massively undertaking, but the first process, and a, you can do these number one and two in any order, but the idea is that there's a form called an IRS form 8850, which is a pre-screening notice and certification request for work opportunity credit. So the way companies use this is they include this with every applicant that applies for the company. In other words, if somebody's applying for the company, they ask them to also complete this form, even though it's optional. In other words, if somebody who is not going to fall under it, they may not, they may just not fill it out. If somebody who would fall under it, as long as you also let people know that if you apply, if if you're fall within one of these categories, it may improve your chances of being hired. So it gives them an incentive to make sure they fill it out, um, fill out the form correctly so that we turn in. In other words, this form is not filled in after you hire somebody. It's filled in on every application that you receive. And then your, and then your hiring decision is based on everything, including this form too. So now, once you start doing this, you would need to set up an account with the Virginia Employment Commission by going to this uh, WOTC address. And once you set up this account, the account has to be approved, which normally takes a couple of days to be approved. But that just means that then you can enter information. All right, step three. <clears throat> now you hire somebody, they filled out this 8850 prior to you interviewing them or anything else. You've interviewed in, so okay, we're going to hire you. Now the employee has to fill out this 9061, which is an individual characteristics form, which basically qualifies what category they fall into. The 8850 is a more broad category form. It doesn't ask exactly what category you fall into, but this, this 9061 asks them exactly what category they fall into because you need that in order to determine the size of the credit you're going to get. All right, now you take this 9061 form. Again, once you do this a couple of times, it actually doesn't take that long. I've several people have done it and it's kind of like, all right, once it's done one time, it's really simple. You take the 9061 and log into your WOTC VEC account and enter the employee's information. The key is, this information has to be keyed in the, in the Virginia system within 28 days from the hiring of the employee. If you don't do it within 28 days, you can't claim the credit. And usually the best thing to do is once the person starts, is go ahead and enter it in the system so you can start going through the approval process. Because what happens is once you submit your, their name in the state system, the VEC is going to process it and or deny it. 
either approve or deny it, um, which could take a couple of weeks. If you haven't heard anything within a couple of weeks, I would certainly call. It depends on how complicated it is. If it's something pretty straightforward, let's just take an example of an individual was a recent relief felon and they were in a Virginia prison, they can probably find the information fairly rapidly through the, through the system. But if it was an individual who was released from prison in say California or something, it may take longer to validate the process. Um, if it's a disabled veteran, they're probably going to also ask for their DD-214 and things like that. So anyway, after a couple of weeks, you certainly want to call to say, hey, what's the status on this particular employee? All right, so once the person, if the person is improved, they will send you this employer certification, which I'll show you an example of in a second. It'll also be in your online account. All right, you cannot claim the credit for employee unless they've reached 120 hours. In other words, you can't even turn in a credit or fill out a forms anyway until they've reached 120 hours because it's done, it's not valid otherwise. Now, if they've reached 120 hours and they're continuing to work, then I would just wait until they've reached the 400 and that way you can claim the full credit and you can't piecemeal it. In other words, you file in 120, you can't file it again once they reach 400. You'll need to take the, the payroll information from all the employees. So now everything's over with. They've reached it. You've done all that stuff. You got the certificate. Now, whoever your, does your tax return, this is your federal tax return, they'll need to take all this information and complete this IRS Form 5884. Okay, as we talked about before, the tax credits can be taken on your business income tax return under business tax credits, if your business is a sole proprietor partnership, it will follow through to your personal tax return. All right. All right, so I'm sure some of the questions, and one of the questions I certainly had when I was looking through this was, well, it sounds like me, if we're asking for some of this information up front, are we causing any discriminatory questions that you know we have to be really careful what we ask in interviews we have to be careful what we ask for in applications how can we ask for this stuff in this particular form so the eeoc has actually issued a legal opinion that states that the form the 8850 is not discriminatory and can be used by businesses as a screening tool so this just gives you a little information to protect yourself if, if that ever comes up. All right, so let's just talk about, this is the first form, which is the 8850. And let me just zoom in real quick to kind of show you. Uh, basically, you would see that the individual would fill out their information. Uh, they would check a box depending on how they fall, what category they fall into. And you, you see that a lot of these programs are combined, a lot of these categories combined, and that's primarily, they do that to the EOC allows the form to be able to be used because it's not particularly asking about the individual, it's just kind of qualifying it within certain categories. And then the applicant signs at the bottom. Again, this is a form that's gonna be filled out by every applicant before they are actually hired. All right, so this is the login that you would, the, where you would set up an account uh, under here where it says request account. You go to, the, this is the, uh, the URL and it would set up an account. Again, it takes a couple of days or a day to be approved. So once that's approved, you are now able to enter the data and that data would be this form here, which is the 9061. <clears throat> which is once you hire somebody, you now say, okay, we need you to fill out this form. And this form is gonna have a lot more particular information as to that particular employee. Now this is only page one, I think it's six pages long. So it's a fairly long form, but it really qualifies where the person falls in which category, because that's gonna be important again, because every category has a different qualification in a different payout. All right, so once that happens, you are now can log into this Virginia system and you'll see under this will say application entry over here on the left hand side. 
and then that will open up another box that will ask you the, the date the person started work. Uh, it'll ask you the information about social security name, the names, et cetera, et cetera. And then it'll go into more detail about the in information actually on that 9061 form. So after, once you submit that, it'll take a little time to go through the processing program. And if once you, you'd be notified it's been approved, you could go in here where it says certificates, you would have to enter the person's social security number at the minimum and hit generate and it will, you need to remove these dates because it will, it will not find it. I usually just delete the date and put in a social security number and hit generate and it'll show you the form. The same thing with denials if it was denied. If you do it, need to do a case search, you can do a case search up here and the same thing, put in the information. <clears throat> now, once an employee is approved, you would get this form here that basically says, not what I wanted to say, let's try this again. It would say certificate, uh, work opportunity tax credit certificate. So it would have your name, employer's name, it would have an employee's name, social security number, the start date, and all the other information listed right here in a sign off. So this is your, your documentation that that person that you submitted is an approved um, tax credit a recipient. So therefore you would be able to apply for it once they meet the 120 or 400 hour requirement. And this is the last form. This is the tax form that's filled out by your tax preparer to show that the number of hours that uh, the individual has, has worked for during this particular time period. All right, so that's pretty much the program. The only thing else I wanna point out to you, two other things I wanna point out. One is if you are hiring somebody who uh, was a convicted, uh, has been convicted of a crime, there is another program called the National Federal, Federal Bonding Program. And this is actually a program that one of my clients told me about that I wasn't even aware of. So thank you to one of my clients for letting me know about that. But basically it provides fidelity bonds for new hires who have had convictions. And this can be juvenile or adult, even if they didn't serve any time, it could be felonies or misdemeanors. Uh, it covers employee theft, forgery, or embezzlement. And it basically provides you as an employer $5,000 of bond coverage for any, any new employee for the first six months of an employee. So if you have somebody you're thinking about and hiring, but you're a little hesitant and say, I don't know what happens if he steals from me, you can take out this bond and it's good for part-time or full-time employee. And there's no fee for it. Okay, so it's a free program run by the state. You'll see the website down here how you can apply for it. So again, I just wanted to point that out as an, another incentive for certain individuals. Also don't want to forget if you qualify for the employee retention credits, don't forget those expire on 1231. Of course you can file for them next year, but they, they expire on 1231 and include startup companies that opened after February 15th, 2020. So if you know of a startup company that opened after February 15th of 2020, they can qualify for the employee retention credits under a recovery business. Um, and that's a, that's a big deal for startup businesses. If there's any questions on that, certainly reach out to us. And also the emergency um, disaster loan program expires on 12-31-21. So make sure if you still need any funds through that, or if you received a loan through that and you think you might need more, you want to request a increase. Um, that's what we've been working on a lot recently is a lot of people wanting second draws or increases. They are certainly entertaining those. So anyway, that is the work opportunity tax credit. Um, Heather, if you wanna stop the recording or leave it going up to you. See if we got any questions.